attitude, then you are ready. Only then are you ready to ask, okay, how much? What's the, what's the real bottom line? So that's what I want to briefly talk about today. And then we get to go on next week and talk about Christmas. So where do we start when it comes to giving to God? Usually, when we hear about giving money in the church, we hear this word, tithe. And if you grew up in church or if you've been going to church for a while, it's a familiar term. Uh, but maybe it's new or foreign to you, this word tithe. The concept of tithing comes from the Old Testament in the Bible. Okay, so a little bit of this is history today. In Old Testament times, the first huge long chunk in your Bible that tells about the Old Testament times, there, there wasn't a church then. Church didn't exist yet. In fact, it was a secret. No one even knew it was coming until the New Testament. Okay, until years later after Christ. But no, so it was secret. So in the Old Testament, God's people weren't found in churches all over the place. They were found in a nation. God's people made up a nation. It was the nation of Israel. They had a government. They had an army. They had a market. They had borders. They had friends. They had enemies. It was a nation. It was a country, just like we know what that is. And God set this nation up with a really unique system of government. Something that we don't even have today. Anyway. The system of government was called a theocracy, which meant that God was the king of the country. God was the king of the nation of Israel. At least that's how it started out. And that meant that in Israel, this is totally foreign to us in America, but this is how it was. In Israel, the state and the religion were perfectly, totally joined. You couldn't separate anything because they were one and the same. Because the king was the God. <coughs> And God instructed, you, you couldn't separate the two, so God instructed the Israelites how to fund this nation. And the Old Testament tells that this nation was going to be funded through a system of tithes. I don't know why I tripped over that word. Tithes, I say it like it's three syllables, it's one syllable. Tithes, there. Uh, but why, if you want to put up on the screen, this is a, a, just a simple definition if this word is new to you. Tithe literally means a tenth. So usually when we hear about tithing, we assume that means paying God 10% because tithe means 10. But in the actual commands that God gives the Israelites, we see something very interesting. In fact, I put those references up there. And if you're a note-taking person, you want to write these down, I wish you would because I'm not going to take the time to read them all, but I'm not making this up. It's in there. So this is where I'm getting this. Okay. These verses give some of the actual commands where God commanded the Israelites to tithe, to give a tenth to God. And it's really interesting when you read through them because Leviticus 27 tells, tells them they were commanded every year to give a tithe, a tenth of what they had from their flocks and herds and crops and so on, to give that to God. And then in Numbers 18, Numbers 18 explains here's what it's used for. It's to support the priests and the Levites who serve in the temple. To, to the ones who look after the sacrifices, who manage the religious worship. Then, in Deuteronomy 14, tells that the people were to bring another tithe to the temple, and this one was different. You didn't just give this one away this time. You brought it to the temple, and you got to eat it. You got to enjoy it. It was a, a feast of worship and celebration, so people would bring this and, and share it and feast on it together. Then, at the end of Deuteronomy 14, Verses 28 and 29, God commands another tithe to be given. This one isn't given every year, it's given every three years. And this tithe was to be used to support the poor and the needy in the land. So you get how, think how cool this is. It, if all of God's commands had been followed, Israel would have been a nation with no poverty. <coughs> no one would go hungry ever. Every person would always have their needs met. God commanded them, it was written right in their law, to be generous and compassionate on those in need. Now, it's worth noting it never happened. Because they never really followed all these commands, not the way God laid it out. So that never really happened, but it could have if they'd done it. So let's do the math. Three times actually listed out here in these passages to God's people. 10% went to the, the priests and the Levites in the temple. 10% was to be taken to the temple and eaten there as a 
feast of celebration, and then another 10% every three years to care for the poor and the needy in the land. You add all these up, and why, if you want to put that big number on the screen, this is an awesome one. A faithful Israelite would pay 23.3% of what they had every year in tithes. It's really two tithes a year and one tithe that happened every three years. 23.3%. Another interesting thing, most of these tithes were paid in the form of food. Most of the tithes they gave, you could eat them. That's different. And someone chucking a carrot cake on the plate that goes by on Sunday morning or whatever. What are we going to do with that? Linda takes it to the bank and says, what are you giving me for this carrot cake? How do I deposit it? Probably wouldn't fit in the night deposit box, would it? Uh, Obviously, this is very different than the way we do it today. Very simply, tithing was the national tax code for the nation of Israel. In our country, we do it separate, right? You, have, you owe taxes to the government, income tax, and the other taxes we pay. That goes to the government, it's the state. And then we give offerings to God, as, as we choose to do, that goes to God. Remember, in Israel, it was no, you didn't separate it, it was the same thing. You're giving to support the nation and you're giving to honor God. It was one the same. Okay. So your taxes and your worship work was all wrapped up together. 23.3% a year if you follow the law. Now that gets really interesting because it is commonly implied that a faithful Christian should give 10% of their money to God. Now I'm not dissing that, but what I want us to think on today is where exactly does that come? Because it was not really that way in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was 23.3%. When you get to the New Testament, after Christ comes and the church begins, it is very different because God forms this. He's not just working with one nation, the nation of Israel now, because this amazing thing called the church. It's this spiritual body where all of his people, all believers everywhere, are spiritually connected together. And they meet in different locations. So now in the world, rather than having God's people in one central location, God's people are meeting even today at this point all over the world in different local congregations like this one, all different sizes, big and small. It's very different. God's people, we don't, we don't support a nation any longer, do we? I mean, obviously we live in a nation. We're required to faithfully, obediently pay our taxes for the nation we live in. But after the, you get to read through the Bible, you get to the Gospels, Jesus mentions tithing a couple of times, and then after the Gospels, zip. It's not even mentioned once. So you read through the rest of the Bible, all the instructions given to the church, that's us. And the command to give tithes to God is not taken away, but it's not repeated either. So you want to go find a debate? <laughs> You can find some strong debate between among Christians who will debate, is this idea of a 10% tithe, is it required by God or not? Well, I'll get back to that, but Hannah read us this passage in 2 Corinthians, and the reason I want us to think about this is, this is an example in the New Testament of a church, Christians in a local church setting like us, an example of how New Testament Christians gave their money. And in this scenario here, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1, we read it, it says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Okay. Uh, this really isn't that tricky, but it's a little tricky because there's three parties involved right in this little section. Okay, so stay with me. Paul is writing a letter to the Corinthian church to tell them about how the Christians in the Macedonian church gave to the Jerusalem church. Get it? That's what's going on. He's writing a letter to Corinth saying, you guys need to learn from the Macedonian Christians, and he's telling them about how they gave to the Christians in Jerusalem. The Macedonia was a Roman province, Greece actually, basically that area. Uh, and it was not a healthy place at this time. Macedonia had been through war after war after war. It was a poor, depressed area. And the, the Christians in Macedonia, this poor, depressed area, were sending money 
two Christians in Jerusalem because in Jerusalem there was a famine going on. Okay. Uh, and in verse 2 it says, he's telling about these Macedonian churches. He says, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. That doesn't even make any sense. If you read that, it doesn't make any sense at all. He, he lists out, he describes these Macedonian churches with a bunch of things that don't even belong together. Something does not add up here at all with what's going on in verse 2. He says, first of all, they're going through, out of the most severe trial, the next thing he says, their overflowing joy, what? <laughs> doesn't make any sense, right? They're, they're in the most severe trial, but let me tell you, out of their joy, well, what are they joyful about? They're in a severe trial. How do you explain that? And then he goes on and says, out of their most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. Okay, so you've got, they're in a severe trial, they're in extreme poverty, but they're extremely happy. And you add all that up, and at the end of the verse it says, it wells up in rich generosity. On a human level, that makes no sense at all, does it? I mean, if you're trying to raise money, you don't go look for the, the people who are suffering the most and have the least. And say, maybe they'll, you know, maybe they'll fund our project. Maybe they'll give to this, right? Doesn't make any sense on a human level. Imagine someone going to these Macedonian churches and saying, how in the world are you guys so generous? And they would answer something like, well, we didn't used to be this generous. It wasn't until, um, you know, we got into such hard circumstances and became flat broke, and then we just learned how to be generous then. Doesn't it make any sense? How do you do that? In our culture, we usually think just the opposite. We usually think, I would be more generous if I had more. Right? Isn't that kind of more natural way to look at it? Well, of course it would be easier to give more to God if I had more than I would give more. Because I had more. But the way we do it, especially in North America, I think, is as soon as our as soon as our income goes up a little bit, we immediately raise our standard of living to match it. I mean, almost immediately. It's just automatic, right? I, I have more money now? Good, I can get this, or I can buy this, or we can start doing that. It's kind of an automatic thing, so it goes up and up, and that's why you find people who make $30,000 a year struggle, and you meet five people who make five hundred grand a year who struggle, because they just... Their, their income went up and their standard of living went up at the same time and they're just as strapped as they were before. It? That's kind of how we do it. So we didn't, well, I, I would give more if I had more. L listen to what John Wesley said a few hundred years ago. He wrote, fairly wealthy guy, he wrote, Money never stays with me. It would burn me if it did. I throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, lest it should find its way into my heart. So how did these people become generous? Look at verse number 5. Verse 5 says, And they did not do as we expected. Of course, they didn't expect much from these poor, destitute people. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us, in keeping with God's will. That's it. Right there. These people had already given themselves to the Lord. Everything that they were, all that they had, their attitude was, it's his. My stuff belongs to him. I belong to him. It's all his. You know, you can be really generous when you don't own anything. You know what I mean? Like, that's your mindset. I don't own it. You can be really generous. You, you, you're kind of freed up. This is the attitude of a, of a true steward. The attitude isn't, how much should I give? The attitude is more like, okay, since none of this is mine anyway, how much do I dare keep for myself? It's a different way to look at it, isn't it? Or, instead of saying, can I afford to tithe? Could I afford to give God that much? Maybe I, I should ask myself, can I justify spending 90% or more of what I have just on me? Those are fun questions. Merry Christmas. Stuff we got to wrestle with, right? But when you understand that everything belongs 
trust in God, and when we really believe it, it becomes easier to just pass something on to others. You, you can become a conduit that God uses to redistribute His wealth. Now, that's a great term. You hear that in, uh, on CNN or Fox News or any, wherever you... You hear that phrase in, in political circles right now, redistribution of wealth, which to me is a really scary term if it means that a human government might be involved in redistributing wealth. Because there's not a government on this planet that I trust to do that very well. But God can certainly do it if He wants, because it's all His anyway, and He can redistribute His wealth just as He's going to do it. This year, I'll tell you, this is a little bit of a humbling story, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, Sharon and I knew for well over a year, there was a, a missionary family they live in Indonesia. They're from Maine. And they actually came and spoke here a couple, three summers ago. Brian Holland Underhill. Anyway, he's a pilot. Maybe some of you remember with Mission Aviation Fellowship. And he's traveling with his family from Maine to Indonesia. And we were gone when they spoke. We came home and listened to the recording of it. And we were telling them, like, we ought to get involved with that. And that sounds really cool. And so for a year, we were like, yeah, we're going to support the Underhills. Then like a year went by, and we're like, yeah, we're going to support the Underhills. And I was like, I guess we're just talking about it. So we finally got around to do it. And uh, so this summer we started, and it became an automatic thing. We just called up and said, look, we want to be added to their support team. This is going to be a regular thing. And it is regular. It's automatic withdrawal right from our checking account every month. Uh, but you know what happened? And, and it was cool because we were being, we were conduits, right? God was funneling some of his money through us to this missionary family in Indonesia. That's really neat. Uh, but you know what happened? At Mission Aviation Fellowship, at their headquarters, they changed computer programs. That The computer program that was uh, running all their automatic withdrawals out of people's accounts. So all of a sudden, they stopped withdrawing it. And like three months went by, and we got to keep our money. Because they weren't taking it out. And I can't tell you why I was so slow to make that call to say, um, look, if you, if something's messed up, and you know, you're know you supposed to be taking our money, and you're not, and we want you to start doing it again. Um, that's bad on me. Three months went by before I said, you know, we've got to be faithful with this. Because God told us to funnel that money to them, and we're not doing it. They even sent us really cool airmail from Indonesia. It's awesome to read really neat letters and pictures and all kinds of stuff. Um, we constantly have to readjust our thinking, right? If I'm gonna if I'm gonna view it as a conduit, because otherwise as soon as the automatic withdrawal stops, it's like, okay, those few extra dollars a month's nice to have those. And maybe they'll work the problem out next month, you know. We are conduits of his money. Now that's just something I'm not telling you to go do that. That's just something God we feel God told us to go above and beyond what we give here, just to get involved in that family. These Macedonian Christians uh, teach us, I believe, how God intends us to give. We are not Israelites living in Old Testament times. We're Christians in the church age. So here's the pattern that he lays out for us. He says, um, in verse number 3, For I testify that they, talking to these Macedonians, they gave as much as they were able. Okay. He doesn't say how much that is. He doesn't give a percentage. He doesn't give a hard and fast number. Don't you wish he would? Wouldn't it simplify things so much if God said, Andy, I'm going to just write it down. There's, that's the dollar amount that I want from you every week. It would be simple. I would like that. Even if I didn't like the number, I would like the simplicity of it. But God didn't do that. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But he says, they gave as much as they were able, which means they gave proportionally. It's based on how much you have. And then he goes on and says, still in verse number three, I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even, what? And even beyond. Okay, so it's not just proportional. It was sacrificial giving. Maybe the idea of just giving 10% to you sounds like such a pipe dream. It sounds crazy. Maybe you say, I just, I don't have close enough money to even consider doing that. 
I read this week Randy Alcorn. He said when he gets that comment from people, he asks people this. If your income was reduced by 10%, would you die? And the answer is usually, well, no. And then he says, well, then you've admitted that you can't afford to give God that much. You're just not willing to do it. Because it does require sacrifice. So verse 3 tells us that they gave as much as they were able, as proportional, and even beyond. So it was a sacrifice. And then it says at the end of the verse, entirely on their own. Because God wants giving to be completely mandatory. So what that means for us is don't feel, don't give because you feel guilted into it. Don't give because the pastor said you should. Please don't give because you hear a sob story from some guy on TV wearing a three thousand dollar suit with a Rolex saying he needs your twenty dollars and you'll get rich if you give it to him. That's another sermon. Sorry. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, this is later on, but actually, let's put this up on the screen. And we'll read this out loud. Oh, should be just the next slide, by the way. I'd like us to read this one out loud together. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So how much should we give? We're back to this question again. Why doesn't God give me just a hard and fast number? That's I like things simple. I need things simple. It would be so much clearer. And the reason he doesn't do that is because it's about a relationship with him. And he wants us to think through this and pray about it. And look at what you have and what you need and what you can live without and he wants you to wrestle with it. And if you're married, couples, this is not an individual decision. This is a husband and wife decision because your stuff is not his and hers. It's yours if you want. Okay? That's not a sermon to but uh, lots of other sermons. So you need to wrestle, you know, you need to get together on that and be on the same page with that. But it's something you need to work out between you and God. And, and uh, examine the scripture. Okay, God, I, I see that I'm supposed to give proportionately for the, what you've given me and, and sacrificially. And it needs to be voluntary. And God will guide you. And you, need to, you need to struggle through that between you and your God. Because we draw closer to that. Because it's closer to Him when we do that. It's a relationship. Now you say, what about tithing? That's where we started. Should we not tithe? I'm not going to say that. Tithing, the reason this is here, and some of you have heard me use this illustration before, and I also come back to it. Tithing is training wheels. That's what it is. Let's, let's look at it now. Okay. Tithing is like training wheels. It's a good way to start out. It's a good way to teach yourself how to give. Once you know how to give, the, tra the training wheels can come off. Okay. And you know, when, when you're learning to ride a bike, training wheels are real good. It saves you a lot of uh, road rash. But after you know how to ride a bike, the training wheels actually slow you down. After you know how to ride a bike, you can actually ride a lot farther and a lot faster if you take them off. It's the same with our giving. So if, if regular giving to God is new for you, I suggest you start with the time. Begin to give 10% to God regularly. And if that sounds crazy to you, I feel like no one actually does that. Come on. Uh, what you need to do is find a Christian or a mature couple who have been doing this a long time. And you need to ask them about it. If you ask another Christian who's never done it before, don't listen to what they say because they obviously don't know how to do it. But find a Christian who does it or has done it for a long time and talk to them and what will happen is you will hear some amazing stories about how God has provided and shown himself faithful time and time again. And you'll hear them say, you know what? Don't knock it till you try it because God shows himself faithful when you step up and do that. And if you're a Christian and if you tithe regularly and maybe you've been doing it 
so long. Um, not ashamed at all to challenge Christians this way. If you've been tithing for a long time and it is so automatic that you don't even think about it anymore, then it has stopped becoming sacrificial to you. And I would challenge you to throw the training wheels away and exceed that. I challenge you to do that. And I, I will boldly say, uh, Sharon and I have done that. And God bless us. You know, every time supporting that missionary couple made us stretch more. It really did. And I didn't really want to do it. I, it's like I wanted to be involved with what they were doing, but I didn't want to sacrifice to do it. It's hard. But it's a blessing to do it, and God provides when you do it. But we needed to, we needed to grow beyond that. And God may want you to do the same thing. He may want you to grow beyond that. So you need to, again, seek God. Maybe as a husband and wife, you need to seek God. Seek God. What's our number? What do you, what do you want from us? What can, how, what, how can we honor you in this way? I want to give the example of John Wesley. He was one of the great evangelists of the 18th century. He was born in 1703. And in 1731... He decided he had a burden for poor people. And he said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start limiting my expenses as much as I can so I can have money to give away to the poor. So in the first year, his income was, he lived in England, his income was 30 pounds. And he found that he could live on just 28 pounds and give away two to the poor. And a year went by and his income doubled. But he kept his expenses the same. So he had 32 pounds to give away, which in that day was a comfortable year's income that he was giving away to poor people. And the third year, his income jumped to 90 pounds, and he gave away 62 pounds. And in his long life, John Wesley's income advanced as high as 1,400 pounds in a year, but he rarely let his expenses rise above 30 pounds so that uh, he, in fact, they, they said in his possession, he hardly ever had more than 100 pounds in his possession. He just gave it away. And the, I know this is totally foreign to our country, but they had this thing in England called the English Tax Commission. Um, and we wouldn't run into this, but over there, uh, this baffled the English Tax Commission. So in 1776, actually, they investigated him. Uh, because they insisted that the man, a man of his income must have silver dishes that he was not paying excise tax on. That's paying excise tax on your dishes. And he, and he wrote him a letter and he wrote, I have two silver spoons at London and two at Bristol. This is all the plate I have at present and shall not buy any more while so many around me want bread. And when he died in 1791, he was 87 years old, and the only money listed out and mentioned in his will was the coins that were in his pockets and the coins in the dresser. Most of the 30,000 pounds he had earned in his lifetime had been given away. He wrote the, I cannot help leaving my books behind whenever God calls me hence, but in every other respect, my own hands will be my executors. That's a totally different mindset than we have today, isn't it? <clears throat> and I think, well, maybe I'll need a will for something, but in most respects, I'm going to be my own executor. In other words, he, he said, I'm going to put a control on spending myself, and I will tithe, and I will go beyond the tithe for the sake of Christ and the sake of his kingdom. 